Uh, just uh, I want to uh, say uh, before I start that uh, the lecturers, myself and Carlo, I uh, would like to uh, thank Hamid um, Bastani, who is uh, a consultant at the World Meteorological Organization, uh, because he really provided great support to our for the preparation of our lecture. Next slide. So um, these are the learning objectives of the lecture. Uh, we will um, in start, you know, just uh, introducing what is the World Meteorological Organization from me, and also what is the Global Framework for Climate Services, which was already mentioned by Alessia and Alberto before. Um, and also, uh, as touched by Alberto, understanding the co-design approach and the, uh, the importance of navigating the data complexity. Uh, we also know what is Copernicus Climate Change Services and uh, uh, the services uh, that uh, uh, Copernicus Climate Change does uh, uh, provide in terms of essential data variable reanalysis data, the year five, and also the recent 1.5 degree application. Uh, back to me then with the climate services value chain and the application on climate risks project. Uh, next steps on how the global framework for climate services will uh, continue, will evolve, uh, within the uh, WMO services uh, uh, governance and uh, also in partnership with many UN uh, uh, agencies and also uh, a lot uh, the NGOs, uh, other agencies and NGOs that collaborate in climate services. And uh, I would like to finish also uh, uh, this lecture by touching on the importance of assessing the socioeconomic uh, benefits and provide a framework or a methodology to do that. So next slide, please. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, uh, the, the, the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization is a United Nations specialized agency with 193 member states and territories, and is the authoritative voice, uh, the UN authoritative voice for weather, water, and climate. Um, as weather, climate, and water cycle have no national boundaries, the international cooperation at the global scale is essential for the development of uh, meteorology and operational uh, hydrology. Uh, and also uh, it's important to realize the benefit uh, for their application. So WMO provides a framework for such international cooperation. And really since uh, its establishment, WMO has played a unique and powerful role in contributing to the safety and the welfare of uh, humanity. Uh, next slide. As I said, the organization plays uh, a leading role uh, in uh, uh, organizational effort to monitor and protect the environment in collaboration with other uh, UN uh, nation, um, uh, United Nations agencies, the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services, WMO support the implementation of several in, uh, environmental convention like the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Montreal Protocol for Ozone, uh, and many other. And is instrumental in providing advice and assessment to governments on initiative and activity to contribute towards uh, the sustainable development and well being of nations. So the worldwide uh, MET services uh, um, agencies work around the clock to provide uh, uh, vital weather, climate, and uh, water-related information to their nations. So their early warnings of severe weather and uh, uh, information, for example, on air quality, 
as well as uh, the climate variability and change, uh, climate variability and climate change, allows decision makers, uh, communities, and individuals to better prepare for weather, climate, and water-related extreme events. These warnings help to save lives and property, protect our resources and the environment, and support socioeconomic growth. So in turn, WMO supports these agencies, these med services, uh, um, the national med services, uh, with this work and helps them to meet their international commitments in the areas of disaster risk reduction, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and sustainable development. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, you know, a little bit of history, uh, saying that over the 40 years, uh, WMO held the three World Climate Conferences. The first one was held in 1979 and led to the establishment of the World Climate Program, the World Climate Research Program, and the International Panel on Climate Change. So the goal of the World Climate Program, which at the moment is still is not operational, was to improve our understanding of the climate system and to apply that, um, that understanding for the benefit of the society in coping with uh, climate variability and change. The World Climate Research Program uh, was established to um, help determine the predictability of the climate and the effect of a human activity on climate. And the IPCC that we all know serves to provide governments with the rigorous um, and assessed scientific information to uh, underpin uh, mitigation and adaptation policies, as well as to inform international uh, climate change negotiation. So even though the IPCC produced their first assessment report in 1990, uh, where the risk, uh, um, uh, where they assessed the, the risks that uh, posed by climate change, um, the institutional capacity and capabilities to respond to such risk are still not fully in place, and particularly at the regional and national scales. And as a matter of fact, the Article 7 of the Paris Agreement calls for strengthening of the scientific knowledge on climate, including research, systematic observation, and climate system and early warning system as well, in a matter that inform climate services and support decision making. So the second uh, World Climate Conference was held in 1990 and led the establishment of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the one that organized the COP and the, one, the next one is going to happen in Glasgow in uh, four weeks, more or less. And uh, uh, the Global Climate Observing System, the GCOS. So the UNFCCC is the intergovernmental platform uh, that facilitates the response to the threats of climate change worldwide. And the GCOS ensures that the observation and the information needed to address climate related issues are collected and made available to users for their adaptation plan. And uh, getting closer to our uh, times, or at least 10 years ago, more or less, um, we recognized uh, the gap that the services for decision making and the climate time on the climate uh, timescales, like from months to multi-decadal, were much less established than the weather services. Uh, that uh, uh, were uh, used and uh, um, the weather services that were used for uh, uh, weather sensitive sector uh, for uh, impacts on few uh, on few hours and several days ahead. And so the um, WMO held the third World Climate Conference in 29 
uh, that focused on empowering the decision maker with appropriate climate information to meet the society's climate related challenges. And the conference called for the establishment of the global framework for climate services to enable better management of the risk of climate variability and change, and uh, as well as uh, climate adaptation and mitigation through the development and incorporation of a science-based climate information and prediction uh, into planning policies and practice. So here we are with the establishment of the Global Framework for Climate Services, uh, which I'm going to explain what it is in the next slide. Thank you. So the vision of the Global Framework for Climate Services was and still is uh, to close the gap between the, the work of the climate science and the needs of decision-making facing climate variability and climate change. As opposed to the traditional supply-driven approaches that focus, uh, first of all, on the technical advances of the climate science, the, 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 the Global Framework for Climate Services wanted to put an emphasis on the fact that the research agenda and information produced through the climate services have to be demand or user driven, meeting the user's uh, content specific needs and accounting for their technical capacity. So the key challenge that were recognized at the time was uh, the inadequate availability and quality of climate data in many parts of the world, the need to create or improve access uh, to climate services by uh, potential users and uh, in almost all the countries, the limited also climate literacy and capacity to deal with the climate related risks in many countries and in climate sensitive sectors. And furthermore, uh, users and providers of climate services had limited experience collaborating and needed to interact more effectively for producing valuable climate services, um, uh, for producing valuable climate services and to match the user requirements. So because of the climate services have to be user driven, the Global Framework for Climate Services define a, a five initial sector or priorities to start developing this interaction uh, and, and establishing uh, a, a better collaboration with the users. And uh, the, um, these five priorities are the agriculture and food security, disaster risk reduction, health, water resources, and energy. And uh, um, there are also, I invite you to go to the Global Film Programmer Services website and there are uh, what they call it exemplar, uh, some reports that explain how to, um, the, 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 the interface with this sector has to be implemented. So the guiding principle, uh, for uh, GFCS, for the Global Framework for Climate Services, was first of all prioritize the capacity development in developing countries and uh, the, the countries which are more most vulnerable to climate impacts. To promote the free and open exchange of climate relevant data where possible, to provide climate services uh, for the public good, uh, as, as, a first, uh, as a first order and uh, facilitate and strengthen the existing activity and not uh, to duplicate effort. And the cornerstone of, uh, of this principle really um, is the imperative to build partnership involving all the stakeholders in the climate services development. As such, um, the partnership was considered um, um, important for co-development, as, as Alberto before said, and delivering and using the climate services and for creating a market for organization investing and using these services. So the, the Global Framework for Climate Services established the what they call it the Partners um, Advisory Committee 
uh, that currently consists of 22 international organizations, including the FAO, the Food uh, um, Agriculture Organization, UNESCO, the World Bank, and also the, uh, the European Commission, as uh, uh, we saw before from uh, the presentation from Alessia. Uh, so the PAC has given direction for GFCS implementation, mostly at the global level. Next slide, please. So there are five uh, uh, foundational pillars of the climate services according to the uh, global framework for climate services. So these are the user interface platform, the climate services information system, the observation and monitoring and the research modeling and prediction and the capacity development, which underpin all the, the pillars. So the user's interface platform provides a structured means for climate services users, a user representative, as well as the researcher and the service provider to interact in order to ensure that the climate and other uh, information are contextualized, relevant to the user needs, and are included in the climate services development. The involvement of users, as we heard before, is critical in order to develop appropriate and actionable product, identify and address the capacity development requirements, uh, and influence the direction of the research and observation activity, and also provide feedback and evaluate the socioeconomic benefit. The climate services information system is the principal mechanism uh, envisaged in the global framework for climate services through which the information about the climate, which include the past, the present, and the future, is collected, stored, and processed. The climate, the, the, the climate services information system enhances the capacity of the nations, uh, uh, the national and the regional center to effectively use global and regional inputs to generate products and services that inform decision-making across the wide range of, of climate sensitive sector. So the top level function of this uh, information system are climate data management, climate monitoring, climate prediction, and climate projection. And these functions include the analysis, reanalysis, diagnostic, interpretation, interpretation, attribution, verification, and delivery and communication. So uh, the climate services information system comprises a physical infrastructure as well of global, regional, and national institutes, center, and computer capability that together uh, with professional human resources develop, generate, and distribute a wide range of climate information products and services and inform uh, on complex decision-making. And later on, we will see an example of uh, this uh, climate information um, system, climate services information system, which uh, is introduced by Carlo Bontempo. Uh, going uh, again with observation and monitoring, this pillar ensures that uh, uh, climate observation and other data uh, necessary um, to, to, to meet the needs of the users are collected, managed, and disseminated. Climate data and also their metadata provided the funda fundamental building block of the climate research modeling and prediction. Uh, for example, for detection and analysis of the climate variability and change, for initializing climate models and uh, used for, for seasonal and interannual forecast, and also to generate simulation for future climate. Data rescue also of the past meteorological records is recognized as an activity of this pillar and ensure the sustainability and use of historical data for climate monitoring. At the global level, 
the gaps in observation and monitoring are addressed by the Global Climate Observing System, the GCOS, and uh, high quality socioeconomic, biological, and environmental data must be effectively integrated with climate data in order to develop and provide users with effective climate services to manage the impact. So the research modeling and prediction, also the other, uh, another pillar of uh, GFCS, uh, aims, is a, uh, is aims to continually improve the scientific understanding and predictability of the climate system at all time scales, uh, the quality of uh, the climate information through modeling, and the tools that address gaps in prediction and uh, uh, data analysis. Key to meeting these uh, objectives uh, of the pillars uh, is uh, the World Climate Research Program, which addresses aspects of the climate science and coordinate the climate research uh, worldwide. This pillar also foster interdisciplinary research and modeling, uh, and modeling related to nat natural science, including social science and humanities and other relevant uh, disciplines uh, to develop the climate services uh, focused on solutions. And finally, the capacity development is the process for strengthening the ability and or capacity of individuals, organization, and societies to solve problems and meet their sustainable development objectives. This is an all-encompassing pillar which addresses the capacity development requirements identified in all the pillars of on all the other pillars of the GFCS. And uh, um, to identify the basic requirement uh, for uh, uh, the GFCS related activities. So effective implementation of GFCS requires a strong linkages between uh, all these pillars, uh, leading to the creation and strengthening of uh, operational system uh, that respond to the demand and deliver relevant services. Next slide. Um, here is uh, just uh, to uh, single out a couple of mechanisms that are already in place uh, that enable the implementation of a GFCS. So at a regional scale, WMO brings together climate expert services provider like the National Med Services and the regional institution uh, in, um, and also international organization in what we call it the Regional Climate Outlook Forum. These were established, they started in 1990, and uh, they produce consolidated regional climate outlooks based on climate prediction through expert assessment in several uh, uh, different regions in the world. And then you can see that this regions are almost covering all the world. Um, early, the, uh, the, these uh, regional climate outlook forums were focused on the climate, uh, on, the on the seasonal uh, timescales of the climate, and especially uh, those modulated by El Nino. Um, but now they are moving to, to to look more at the longer term uh, variation and changes. So through the interaction with users and the key economic sector in the region, uh, as well as also the uh, extension agencies and policy makers, uh, these archives uh, support the access to credible climate information and assess the likely implication of the climate outlooks in key sector. And, uh, and, and in the region, and explore also ways that these outlooks could be used for regional uh, stakeholders. And uh, the process uh, usually for these uh, um, outlook forums 
are uh, uh, includes meetings with the regional and international climate experts to develop the consensus based regional climate um, outlook. Um, then there is uh, there are interactive section uh, which involves climate scientists and representative from user sectors for identify uh, the impacts uh, um, and uh, try to together formulate a response and strategies. There is also a training workshop on seasonal climate prediction to strengthen the capacity uh, of the national and regional um, uh, expert climate expert. And also uh, there are special outreach session which involve the media expert to develop effective communication strategy. Uh, so the GFCS builds upon this uh, um, regional climate outlook uh, uh, forum approach, uh, which is important an important component for regional implementation of uh, GFCS. Um, I'm trying to, I'm worried on the time and I try to speed up. Um, the national framework um, for, and then another element is the national framework for climate services, which provide an effective way to establish institutional mechanism to coordinate, facilitate and strengthen collaboration among the national institution and other key stakeholders within a nation. And uh, this also, um, this national framework for climate services are increasingly being recognized as a very useful mechanism for the development and the consolidation of national capacity in connection to policy processes and the formalizing partnership with key sectoral uh, organization at the national level. For example, the Green Climate Fund and other climate financial mechanisms uh, have recognized this, uh, 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 this national framework for climate services as, as a foundational step for the implementation of climate adaptation projects. Um, so the World Bank, for example, uses use this national framework for climate services uh, to inform uh, the, their hydrometeorological uh, investment in several countries. And also um, the climate investment funds, uh, climate risk and early warning system program has used uh, this uh, um, framework, national framework approach to identify priorities and cost actions. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, uh, just uh, finishing off my part is WMO members assess their capacity for providing climate services and documented associated socioeconomic outcomes and benefit through a checklist that addresses functional capacities across the climate services value chain. This uh, checklist um, uh, uh, of functional capacity of the national MET services has been deployed, developed, and distributed. And these surveys, the, capacity, uh, the, the capacities surveyed are grouped in six domains, that which is the governance, the basic system, the user interface, the capacity development, and the provision and application of climate services and monitoring evaluation of socioeconomic benefit. These data are coming uh, to WMO, which are, um, which are uh, analyzed, and the results are published in uh, annual status of climate services report, which you can see here. The first one was in 2019. It was uh, the, climate state, uh, the, the, the state of the climate services report focuses on agriculture and fuel security. And the second one was published in 2020. It was focusing on the risk information and early warning system. The upcoming one uh, is that will be launched at the COP26 in Glasgow, will focus on climate services and water resources. Next one. And uh, so the reports not only uh, assess the capacity of on the status of the climate services uh, 
at the national level and uh, the capacity of the net services, but also provide st case studies and examples and an explanation of the role of climate information and services um, uh, using also data from partners of uh, the global, uh, the GFCS partner, partner advisory committee. And I invite you to, to go to the website of WMO and uh, to download these uh, um, reports. Um, over to you, Carlo. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, and I think we have to, to do a bit of a, of a speed up in, in, our, in our talk because uh, we are lagging a bit behind. But it was so interesting to listen to what, what you were saying, Roberta. Um, I guess one, you know, this is a bit of a, of a change in, uh, I don't know if you can see me, I don't see myself, but um, I'm not sure this is hugely important. But this is a, a bit of a, of a change in, uh, in, in TAC. So we, we heard from Roberta about, um, you know, the, the, the grand scheme of things, what, what's going to happen or what's happening at the global level. Um, and what I would like to talk to you about is something a bit more regional, if not even personal. So next slide, please. And I would very much like to start from uh, one of the outputs of a project, uh, uh, an FP7 project, so a project funded by the European Commission now nearly 10 years ago about climate services. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to be responsible for this project called Euporias. And one of the output of this project was a set of principle of climate services. So we, we went through the, the grand scheme of GFCS and WMO, and I just want to uh, you know, dive down to a very specific case. So we, we took a, a bunch of experts on, on climate services, practitioners, uh, meteorologists, climatologists, and users, and we put them in a, in a nice location for a few days with the purpose of identifying a few key principles that a good climate service should respond to. And this, um, as you can see, they were summarized in, um, by a scribe in this uh, pictogram. And um, uh, we ended up with, with seven. But if, if you see them, they are mostly about the interaction. So they are quite gen general, but they're all about the interaction between the provider of, inf of the information, the, the provider of the service, and the user of the service. The idea um, being that, you know, in the development of climate services, this component of uh, co-development or co-design or co-production, depending on, on the level of engagement, is key. You cannot have a service just by having a provider and a, a great set of data. So um, if, you, if you were to take just uh, two, and you can find those on the web, there are, there are plenty of references. If, if you were just to pick two of those services, uh, of those principle, next slide, please. Probably the, the more important one is, is this uh, understanding the, the user chain. So one of the things we learn, not just uh, doing uh, this uh, uh, European project, but also in what has happened since that project, is the fact that the value change from the provider of, of the uh, data and the information to the user is typically quite complex. It's not necessarily done in a single step. It can involve different kinds of player, different level, and understanding what is the value that each one of these player is getting out of, of the process is, is fundamental. And by value, I don't necessarily mean monetary value, while monetary value is clearly part of the value, there are other values that need to be recognized. And it's a transaction. So this climate service is a transaction, at least by uh, between a provider and, uh, and, uh, and a user of the service. And understanding what is the payoff of the transaction is fundamental for, for that service to work. So these are a few key principles. And um, they've been picked up by many practitioners since, and have been used as a one reference and I think nobody challenged any of them uh, yet. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, to listen to your own challenge. Uh, next slide, please. And elaborating on this, um, this actually is taken from a very nice seminar that uh, Paco, Paco Dobler Reyes gave at the CNWF at the annual seminar uh, last year. Um, you can see this change going from the data to the decision making as a 
generic model for a service where you have a, a first transformation from raw data and this raw data may be observation, maybe uh, view analysis, maybe seasonal forecast, and you transform it into um, up to certain level of information or knowledge, which may mean, you know, tailored seasonal forecast or quality assessment about that forecast. But in order for this to become a service, then there are other elements that become important. Um, it becomes important to have uh, a support uh, uh, to, to that service. It, it becomes important to have training material, to have documentation, to have uh, a number of uh, ancillary elements that make uh, that transformation from information to, to service. And even that service is still one step, at least one step away from the decision. So the user may take that service and make an elaboration themselves before really informing a decision uh, uh, or, or a policy. So uh, there is a simplification where you see three steps, uh, data, information, service, and, and decision-making. Actually, this, change, uh, this chain can involve more players and more elaboration. But the fundamental element is, is that data per se is not a decision, it's not, it's not a service. It, it, it needs to be contextualized, needs to be transformed into something that is um, understandable and user specific and, cont and context specific. That said, um, one of the challenges we faced, and I mean, uh, you can probably see a similarity between what I'm explaining here and what Roberta was presenting in the GFCS, because in a sense, we follow uh, at the regional level, something quite similar in terms of approach. But one of the challenges that we face in the implementation of this chain is the fact that there is a level of complexity on the left-hand side of this plot, on the data side, that um, is a blocking element. So next slide, please. So if you look at climate services, then you, you have a variety of the data sources. They, they can be satellite information, they can be in situ measurement, it can be reanalysis or seasonal prediction or climate projections. And before you can transform all of this uh, data into an application that may sit on, a, on, a, on your smartphone, well, then you need to process a huge amount of data. So part of the problem in, in this tailoring, in this definition of a service and delivering of a service is the diversity of data sources and the shared volume of data. Um, just to give you an example, the global reanalysis uh, era five, the data set itself is in the order of petabyte of data, eight, 10, depending on, uh, on what you look at. But that's the order of math, tens of petabytes of data. And this is something you cannot easily interrogate if you don't have um, a tailor and uh, uh, set up uh, infrastructure to, to deal with that. So if part of the problem is the diversity and the volume of the data, then next slide, please. Part of the solution is to develop a uh, um, well-made uh, infrastructure to transform this petabyte of data in the few kilobytes of information that may actually trigger the decision trigger or inform the policy. That process, as we seen before, is not a, a one-step process. It's a, it's a process that requires a variety of players at different level, but still is a process that requires an investment at the basic level to make this data and information accessible. So this is what we have done through the Copernicus program with the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And you can see the central block of this proposition to be this uh, computer block, so to speak, is what we call the climate data store. And it's a way of simplifying and making more accessible and transparent the, all the data that is available. And in the process also freeing up the data. So all the data that is available on the climate data store is open and free and can be used for any sort of application without restriction, apart from the acknowledgement of the source. So it can be used for research, but it can also be used for uh, commercial purposes or uh, education or anything else. So this is um, what, what we're doing, is a specific case, is a, as uh, Roberta was saying, is a, is a specific case of an information system that is up and running and, and it works. And so far it has attracted um, nearly 100,000 users to whom we deliver something in the order of 70 terabytes of data per day. Next slide, please. So the data you can find there, um, I would spend the next few slides just to tell you what what you can find in the climate data store and how this is working. 
but there would be a, additional session during the, the school that will go a bit deeper into how this infrastructure has been used for uh, informing energy practitioners specifically. So one of the key elements are the essential climate variables as defined by the global climate observing system that Roberta was mentioning before. And this is a set of variables that are considered essential, uh, as the name says, to describe the climate system. So the Climate Change Service gives access to 22 of those uh, 55 ECVs, essential climate variables. And this is a list that is growing with time. So we, we hope to get a richer set in the near future. Next slide. I mean, we heard uh, even today in a number of occasions, the reference to the seasonal prediction, these are very important in managing the climate risk. And one of the key aspects of the um, climate change service is the ability to give access to the predictions, uh, seasonal predictions. These are the predictions made by ECNWF model itself, but also by the Global Producing Center of WMO in Europe. So this is Met, Met Office in the UK, Meteo France, uh, DWD in Germany. Uh, as well as CMCC in Italy. And on top of those uh, uh, data set, um, there are also in-kind contribution from uh, US, uh, Japan, and Canada, and in probably in the near future also from Australia. So this data is combined in a multi-system system. system. Uh, so what you see on the bottom is the prediction for uh, June, July, August uh, last summer made by the multi-system. Uh, for the uh, precipitation, but you also have prediction in terms of time series for El Nino or the uh, polar vortex, so to speak. You see the output here, in, in, uh, these are the graphical output, but the important element is that um, the raw data is available and you can access it and without restriction, both in terms of forecast and the hindcast. Another point worth highlighting uh, at this school is the fact that of all the data set that we have available on the climate data store, the seasonal prediction are alongside the sectoral information system output, the data set that have the largest uh, fraction of private sector users. So there is an interest from the private sector in using this data, and this is growing over time. Next slide, please. The um, other key element in the, in the climate data store in the C3S is the access to the, to the cloud projections. So these are the CMAP6 simulations uh, with new functionalities. These are based on the data that is available through the SGF nodes, but there are um, also some extra functionalities, for instance, for subsetting the data on download. And also the um, Cordex data, so the high resolution regional climate model simulation available not only for the European Cordex domain, but also for uh, a number of a large number of um, uh, extra European Cordex domain. So this is uh, uh, already available through the climate data store and an effort has been made just to address that complexity I was referring to, to make as much as possible the data uh, interoperable and uh, easy to combine with one another. Next slide, please. But um, by far the most uh, uh, popular data set on the climate data store, the one that has the largest fraction of the user and for which the user have expressed more interest and generated more queries is the reanalysis. So these are the era five reanalysis of CNWF and in the future will be the era six, but also the regional reanalysis for Europe and the Arctic. So what you see here is, a, is an example of the comparison of the era five, which is higher resolution than the previous era interim data set in reproducing a tropical cyclones over North America. And in the bottom, you see uh, the uh, increase in the, in the global mean temperature, especially in the, in the troposphere uh, as seen by the reanalysis system. So this account for roughly, well, slightly more than 50% of our user and a significant fraction of our uh, data volume. And reanalysis represent really one of the key elements in the generation of climate services. Next slide, please. But what, what I meant when I was referring to the complexity of the data layer is the fact that the data is so big that is very difficult to process if you don't have a dedicated uh, platform. So what you see here is an example of a way of processing the data that doesn't require 
a huge download, but actually rely on a cloud infrastructure. And these are a model that we are seeing over and over uh, um, expanding all over the, the globe uh, is what uh, Google uses or AWS, uh, at Amazon and so on and so forth, where a, a significant part of the calculation uh, of uh, operating on this large data set are actually done close to the data set prior to any download. So what you see here is an example where um, the reanalysis data is used to, in this case, extrapolate trends in, in uh, global mean temperature and estimate when the 1.5 degrees will be reached um, globally. Um, there are many other examples, some of, of which are more relevant to, to the energy sector. But the reason why I picked this one is because this was uh, put together quite recently. But more importantly, and is the point I want to make, is that this is entirely transparent. So you see this plot. Uh, you may want to see what we have done, what are the assumptions we made. So you can find the documentation there, but you can also see the code that we use to generate this plot, reuse it, share it, transform it, or use it as a base for further development. And all the calculation will happen on, on a server uh, that momentarily is in, is in Reading and from a few weeks down the line will be running in Bologna in Italy but it's not on your laptop. So that's a change in, in the structure, it's a change in, in the system. Next slide, please. And I think I can, with this slide, I can pass it over back to, to Roberta. I think you're muted. Yeah, no, no, okay. So thank you, Carlo, and uh, uh, very, very ex exciting uh, new developments for uh, the uh, Copernicus uh, uh, Climate Change Services. And um, I've been told that I need to speed up because uh, uh, we already cover all our time. And uh, so I'll do that. I may you know, skip a lot of uh, slides now, uh, and uh, I also uh, want to remind you that uh, the slides will be available, so you can go back and uh, and look at them. But um, what I want to to, to show you now is uh, the way that we scan, um, the schematic of uh, actually how we are implementing these climate services, and uh, uh, and how we build uh, projects. Oh, with them. So, um, and this is a graphic that comes from uh, the WMO, World Bank, uh, uh, and USAID handbook on valuing weather, uh, water, and climate services, which was published in 2015. Um, and these are show the components of the value chain um, of the climate services which are approximately, they, they build on the pillars of the GFCS. And so this uh, uh, climate services value chain uh, is underpinned by the WMO hydromet system and services, which is on the top graph. Uh, but the full value chain for climate services encompasses user uh, action and outcomes, and also the evaluation of socioeconomic cost and, and benefit. So it shows that, that there are there are say no hydromet elements or you know data um, uh, producing uh, 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 expertise in the value chain um, that the rec that the these uh, service providers need to engage. Uh, with these uh, uh, non-hydromet stakeholders. So guidance for this engagement is provided in the current GFCS implementation as we saw before. And, uh, and uh, I just want to say here that uh, um, an evolution, next slide please, uh, an evolution of this uh, schematic of the climate services uh, value chain Next uh, uh, slide, please. Um, is will be uh, um, developed in a new publication that WMO and and WMC is is leading um, 
and uh, which we hope to enable a wide uptake of the integrated weather and climate services for the energy uh, to, uh, for the energy system and to support and accelerate the net zero energy transition. And uh, this is just a preview of the publication uh, where we, we provide an updated framework for, uh, um, for the conceptualizing weather and climate services and the value chain. And also building on the framework uh, that I previously developed uh, WMO and GFCS. And the next one, please. And here I'm going to provide just one example of a project that uh, uh, how we implemented the uh, climate services value chain approach for uh, um, developing uh, um, concrete uh, actions and concrete um, uh, climate services. And this comes from Focus Africa, which is an Horizon 2020 project. It was mentioned before, like uh, uh, from Alberto and also Alessia. Um, and to develop climate services in Africa. And the, the project started in September 2020, uh, approximately one year ago. And there are several case studies, uh, but uh, this one is on uh, the energy sector and is focused in Tanzania. Uh, and um, the case studies is uh, looking at the, uh, at the situation of Tanzania, where hydropower is the largest source of renewable energy. Um, but the country also has a high dependence of biomass, and which leads to deforestation, and also uh, other sources of uh, energy, which is uh, uh, fossil fuel um, combustion and natural gas and also coal. So, um, the, our, our user is Tanesco, which is uh, the main energy company in Tanzania, and uh, um, they want to diversify energy generation to include more solar, wind, and hydropower uh, that also depend from uh, meteorological variables, and also build energy systems that are uh, demand-driven and are also climate uh, resilient. And I invite you, uh, I stop here with this example, and I invite you to uh, go to the website of Focus Africa and to learn all about the climate services that we are um, uh, developing in this project. And uh, please uh, go uh, to next slide and next slide. And next one. And also next one, sorry. <laughs> so what next for GFCS? Um, after 10 years of the implementation, uh, we say that there are built-in blocks that are already in place. And the combination of these building blocks can provide a framework for the next phase of GFCS. So uh, the elements that are in this slide I uh, intend to inject the, the, the GFCS implementation into the international climate action um, uh, landscape. And uh, um, so th for the next step, we are going to focus more on uh, uh, not only on what we want to uh, produce, but also, uh, also focus on how we are going to produce this. And, um, and have more interact, interactive uh, uh, implementation of, of uh, GFCS. We continue tracking and progress and increasing ambitions. And, uh, and also to, instead of considering just standalone initiative and implementation, we want to uh, align them and uh, support more um, uh, action at the international at the international climate policy framework, and uh, uh, also looking at the financial uh, mechanism. And uh, next one, uh, Carlo, if you want to say a little bit more about the partner well, advisory uh, committee. Yes, maybe I can say a word, but I think we should really wrap up and the slide will be there, as you said, and we are available for, for questions. So I think it's more important to leave some time for a Q&A at the end than sure. just to go through the slide. But it's just to say that the, the PAC, the Partner Advisory Committee of GFCS, is more active than ever 
uh, also because the landscape of, of the user has changed and there is really an appetite now for um, for climate data that goes way beyond uh, you know the usual suspect, the academia, the climate expert, and so on. There are the big organizations, the World Bank, the International Federation for Red Cross and, Red Cross and, and uh, the insurance groups and, and the like. They are really interested and, and active. So um, it's just to, to stress that this uh, has been fully recognized by WMO and, and the PAC is, is very active and in the new governance structure as an important voice to play in shaping the priority and the next step of GFCS. So maybe I can leave it there. Yes, I think uh, just so we go at the end, at the last slide uh, where we wrap up. Yeah. Uh, the one before. Okay, can we, Roberta, Hello. sorry, can we leave it here? Yes. Can we leave it sure. here for everybody to see? And uh, thank you very much, Roberta and Carlo, for the very informative uh, lecture on uh, the state of play for the global activities and the European one, and uh, a great uh, stage and setup for the rest of the school. Uh, I'm afraid we've eaten on uh, question and answer time. So I invite everybody to type your questions, still type your questions, and uh, if possible, Roberta, and I don't know if Carlo if you can stay a bit longer, uh, answer questions, but uh, unfortunately we need to move on to the next uh, 